The Morris worm spreads through four mechanisms, and these are respectively RSH, the finger daemon, send mail, and R exec. And I've actually listed these four mechanisms in more or less the same order in which they were uh, tried by the Morris worm. Now, the finger daemon and the send mail mechanisms that are employed by the Morris worm to spread, both of these mechanisms exploited technical programming flaws. The RSH and R exec mechanisms, on the other hand, didn't exploit programming flaws, but rather they, they took advantage of other weaknesses on the system. For example, things like uh, trust relationships uh, and also things like uh, weak passwords. I'll describe the underlying mechanisms behind how both RSH and RExec were exploited by the Morris worm in this video, and I made other videos describing other aspects of how the Morris worm spread via other mechanisms. These uh, RSH and RExec services in Unix basically allow a user on one computer system to execute a command remotely on another system. And of course, as you might expect, uh, for one system to connect to and execute a command on a remote system, it is required that these systems are connected together as part of a, a broader computer network, for example, the internet, or perhaps those systems are part of the uh, same local network. Now, spreading over RSH was the first choice of propagation mechanism for the Morris worm, and I'll talk about how that works in a bit more detail. So it turns out that some systems on the internet have pre-established trust relationships with other systems on the internet. And you can find these relationships listed in very specific files on Unix systems. Uh, these files include things like the slash etc slash hosts dot equiv file. Um, that file is available system wide. Also the dot r hosts file, uh, which is actually a file that's maintained on a per user basis. Now to leverage that trust relationship of the hosts that are listed in the in the r host file, you actually do need to be logged in as the user in question, which means that you need to know the password associated with that user. The Morris worm actually accomplishes this step by simply guessing the password. And it uses an intelligent password guessing scheme. Now I made a separate video describing how the Morris worm guesses passwords, so I won't repeat that, that content here. The main point is that if a host name is listed in one of these files, then the underlying system will accept RSH connections from that host name. And so similarly, it stands to reason that if you see a host name listed in either the slash etc slash hosts.equiv file or one of the .r host file on a given system, then there's a decent chance that there is a reciprocal trust relationship. In other words, that system that's listed will also accept connections from the original host. And there's a decent chance you can RSH into one of these hosts without having to resupply the password. In any event, if you are logged into a system, you can actually effectively propagate the authorizations afforded to you within the local system onto a remote system as long as that remote system is in that trusted circle, so to speak. And similarly, the RSH command provides you with a remote shell. And in fact, when you, when you see this term remote shell, it's, that's actually what RSH stands for. A remote shell is simply a vehicle by which you can issue commands to the system, and in this case, it happens to be a command that's issued remotely. Now the Morris worm uses RSH from one computer to establish a remote shell on a separate trusted computer. And then having established that shell, the worm will copy itself and execute itself onto the remote system. It's actually quite uh, simple when you think about it that way. So I've described how the Morris worm uses RSH. What I'll do now is switch gears slightly and talk about the use of RExec by the Morris worm. And it turns out that the use of RExec is similar to the use of RSH. RExec also allows someone to execute commands on a remote system. In fact, RExec stands for remote execute. However, I think one key difference between RSH and RExec is that RExec requires you to explicitly know the password of a particular user. And as I mentioned earlier, the Morris worm employs a number of mechanisms for guessing passwords. And these mechanisms are discussed actually in a separate video, as I said earlier. But suffice it to say that in 1988, people would often choose very poor passwords that were very easy to guess. And so the Morris worm would try to log in as different users using password guessing schemes. And if it succeeded, it would then try to connect to other systems in that particular user's trusted circle via the rexec command. Approaches involving password guessing had lower priority with regard to the Morris worm. I mean, there are multiple propagation mechanisms. 
and the password guessing mechanisms weren't really employed until other techniques were tried first. Uh, these techniques, as I mentioned earlier, include things like propagating via a passwordless version of RSH, via the finger daemon, via send mail, and, and so on and so forth. I suspect, though, that the reason for this ordering has to do with the complexity of guessing passwords. Even though people chose passwords that were not, let's say, difficult to guess uh, in a relative sense, it still might take a decent amount of time to guess all the possibilities. Uh, in the context of the Moore's Worm, doing a full password search actually required about four weeks of effort, uh, and that's not a short amount of time. Uh, and so as a result, uh, even though passwords were relatively easy to guess, it could still take a long time to try all possible easy to guess passwords, so to speak. So that's basically how the Morris Worm would leverage RSH and RXEC uh, in conjunction with things like password guessing as it needed to uh, in order to propagate over the internet.